All right, welcome back to TIFF Doc Conference. We've got uh, some terrific sessions to finish out this day. Uh, the uh, next session uh, is with the is around the making of the film The Elephant Queen. The Elephant Queen. It's a grand, beautiful wildlife film uh, from Victoria Stone and Mark Diebel. Uh, we showed the world premiere uh, this past week. And it got bought by Apple, one of the first really big documentary buys by Apple, showing uh, their uh, new commitment to uh, documentary film. So we're very excited by that. Um, we have a uh, promo teaser that has not been seen uh, before. Um, I want to make sure that no one is taping this, because we've assured the filmmakers that uh, that it won't go any further than what you're about to see right now. So let's watch that uh, promo teaser from The Elephant Queen. All right, please join me in welcoming the filmmakers, Victoria Stone and Mark Diebel. Uh, so, uh, Victoria and Mark, you know, we show all kinds of different uh, styles of nonfiction uh, filmmaking at the festival, but I don't often uh, uh, get a chance to show, um, you know, such a deep dive into uh, wildlife filmmaking, and I feel like I have the least understanding of how one of these films uh, gets uh, put together. Um, it, this has been eight years in the making uh, of this film. Uh, let me start by asking you what your backgrounds are that you know that set you up to to make this film. Uh, Victoria, can can you start? Yes, we we've been making wildlife films in um, East Africa for thirty years, and it took until about eight years ago for us to decide we were ready to take on elephants. So we've been we spent most of our lives deeply immersed in the wild in Africa. We started underwater, but then migrated to the land. Um, and um, yeah. What was so, your start? How did, what was your entryway into uh, making wildlife films? Well, I came from the Royal College of Art as a photographer. And, and I was a zoologist. But we, we learned um, to dive at the same time and met, met learning to dive. And that sort of, you know, when that took us off down to, to Cornwall and, and doing a diving survey, which we then decided that having, having done a diving survey, we really wanted to try and communicate to people what it was like underwater in this particular area, which was threatened by a container port at the time. So we, we produced, a, or Vicky produced, a, um, an exhibition of, of still images, which toured the country. And then we were, we were keen to try and develop that into something, into moving images. And so we, we set ourselves the task of trying to raise money to buy a camera but and make a half hour film about the, the marine life in the estuary. But at that stage, we, nobody knew who we were, no one would back us. Um, so we just had to get other jobs, earn the money, buy the equipment, which in those days was a lot more, <laughs> it was on right. film. Um, and then just do it. And we, we basically bolted the film together at a local art school and then took it round everywhere and we were lucky enough to sell it and then never really looked back. Hmm. And so for 20 years or so, you somehow sustained your uh, careers uh, doing these kinds of films. So yeah, yeah, non-stop, yeah. yeah. We, we, start, we, we started off underwater and then um, Alan Root, who is a we think probably one of the finest wildlife filmmakers who was based in Kenya. He saw our first film and said, will you come and film for me um, for a series for Survival Anglia um, in Africa? And we thought, goodness, why, why on earth does he want to try and pull people out of the water and put them, on, <laughs> put them into the Serengeti? And for a year, we, we tried to refuse. But in the end, we admired him and his films and the fact that he, was, um, he authored his films. Um, and we really wanted to learn. So in the end, we, we couldn't prevaricate any longer and we went and joined him in, in Serengeti in 1987. And really, we've stayed in, in Africa ever since. Yeah, so we, we ended up bringing up our family in the bush and mm. you know, most of our life is spent under canvas. Um, on the and uh, so at the beginnings of, of this project coming together, what were you thinking that you wanted to make and uh, why? And and how did you feel it was going to be set apart from you know, other things that maybe have covered similar territory? I think we'd all, always resisted 
elephants um, because they, they've been filmed so much in the past. Um, and we'd always concentrated on sort of smaller, more interconnected, ecological and evolutionary stories. But and actually, it, I should just pause right yes. there. You, you probably get a sense, if you didn't see the film uh, this weekend, just from this promo reel, that it's not only about elephants, but you very much are looking at the interconnectedness of all the species who live in this world down to the smallest dun beetle. Yeah. And, and that, was, that was our intent. I mean, because we'd, we'd seen the interactions that elephants have. They'd always been somehow tangential to our lives filming in the bush. But every now and again, we'd see a little interaction and we'd file it away. And then there was a terrible drought in 2009-10. And we'd, we were filming, we'd been asked to go to Amboseli where there was, the elephants were dying, the babies were in terrible, <laughs> terrible trouble. And we've been asked to go there and film. So it was seeing those elephants there and really getting to know them as individuals, but then realizing that there was so much more to them as they are you know, such a, a key species. A key, they're called a keystone species. And so much of the, the life around the waterholes essentially depends on elephants. And we thought we could combine the two. We tell an elephant story, but at the same time bring in all these other characters um, that, that are part of, a part of the wheel of life which spins around them. I think because we knew that we were um, making a feature-length film, we knew we needed a big, charismatic um, lead character. Mm. And then, but we also knew that to do an entire film just on elephants was probably to keep it to one-dimensional. So we wanted to make sure that you, you know, you're, you're rooting for the little guys as well and you're understand that the, the, the story revolved around the complexity of, of all of their lives. Mm -hmm. So you eventually identified the, the herd that you wanted to, to follow, and did you uh, know the story that, that uh, do you imagine the story that you were gonna tell then? Well, actually the first thing we did was try and identify a waterhole, which we thought would be the perfect nucleus for the, you know, for the story. And um, I actually did a recce with Etienne, who I think, who was our assistant director, who's in the audience. Um, and we found this amazing waterhole, and it was clear, you could, you could see right into it. We had bullfrogs there, we had all the, all the birds and the, the fish, and we even found a, a crocodile there. And we thought, well, this is the place. You know, there were elephants all around. We thought, we'll just, we'll base ourselves here. So we, we renovated an old camp, we cut an airstrip, and we based ourselves there and in the hope that it would rain again and this, this waterhole would come to life. Uh, we spent 18 months there and it never did. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it actually took us um, two years to find Athena. And we, we always say we didn't really find her, she actually found us because one day out, we, our, our kitchen is just like a very sim simple little straw hut open thing. And one day she was standing out at the back of the kitchen with um, her family and almost sort of inviting us to tell her story. Wow. Yeah, we go out every day on a, on a drive looking for the, the perfect elephant. And we were very keen that, because what, what, we'd, what we'd done, we'd moved our camp into the National Park at that stage. And we really wanted to get one of the, the very big tuskers, because there aren't many of them left. There's probably only a handful left in the wild now. And so we thought, well, if we're going to do it in Savo, which is where these big tuskers live, we have to find ourselves you know, a, a classic Savo tusker. And that was, so we'd been out all day sort of um, looking, looking for the perfect female. But when we came back into camp, there she was. And when she swung her head round, and we saw just how perfect those tusks were and how calm she was and how the, the size of the family was right with the, with the babies and just, you know, not too many of them. And that was, you know, that was essentially... You couldn't cast uh, your yeah. herd of elephants. Uh, <laughs> the, the, I mean, we, we knew we were looking for a female. I think one of the things that was really attractive to me about the story was that it was all about female leadership mm -hmm. and about how the, the, with, with elephants, the older you are, the wiser you are, and the more you can then lead your family to safety, to better feeding grounds. And it literally has a direct relationship to how successful your herd is in breeding. Mm -hmm. And the, it's just the, the way in which the matriarch, in this case Athena, holds that knowledge and uses it in a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. um, if you watch a lot of documentaries like I do, uh, you've seen a lot of films about poaching and uh, to the point now with the first thing when I think about elephants, I think about poaching. Mm -hmm. Can you describe where this is taking place? You know, how much that is a, uh, is a danger and... 
uh, and I think how, I, how much, to the extent you had to deal with that. Yeah. So firstly, just to address, your, you, know, you expect to see a film about poaching. This is not a film about poaching. Right. This is a film, we, we wanted people to fall in love with elephants and we knew because of the, if we took people deep into their lives, because they're so like us, you can't help but be drawn in and think, well, I, I wouldn't kill you know, my neighbor, why would I kill an elephant? Um, but I like these elephants more than I like many of the people in the films uh, <laughs> at this year's festival. Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing is, poaching does remain, obviously, a huge problem. Um, and we, we were so aware of it where, where we were. In our, in our first campsite... I mean, is it, yeah. when you describe yourself as being camped in a place where these elephants are traveling through, mm. like, is, it a, is it a risk uh, of oh, violence? Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, I think we were quite... Initially, we were quite lucky because I think the poachers were more more focused on the elephants than they were on us, you know. And, but it, it came to a stage in our first campsite where there was a raid on a, um, on a ranger vehicle um, just 600 metres from our camp, and Etienne had to fly two, two shot rangers out. To, and what, to, one actually died in the plane. One died, and, we, and we just thought, you know, if, if we're here supporting national parks by, by flying, and look, you know, essentially we're going to be next, next on the list. And the trouble, we were targeting the same water holes as the poachers, so we were going there in the daytime trying to film the elephants. The elephants were terrified of poachers, and they were coming at night. Um, and we just thought, sooner or later, we're going we're gonna to meet. And we're, we don't have any, any weapons in our camp. Um, so we'd have come off worse. But in that period, we were definitely living with the awareness. I mean, we had a strategy for what we would do in the middle of the night if we were raided. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, you, we're out in the middle of nowhere with n no, no fences, no nothing, just in the wild. Um, so you do have to be um, just one step ahead. Yeah. Uh, so you described that you took 18 months to, to find uh, your, your main elephant. Can I ask just in a practical way, like, you know, how do you sustain, uh, you know, yourselves in a production with 18 months of, uh, of waiting? Um, because we have a very small, tight, dedicated, wonderful team. And everybody was, it was a bit like a snowball, this film. It started really small. It started with Mark and I making it. And then Etienne joined us and then someone else and someone else. And everybody was joining because of their passion for filmmaking, yeah. elephants, and they could see what was happening to elephants. Mm -hmm. And I think it was that that allowed people, to, or may, people became involved and gave far much more of their time mm -hmm. and energy and expertise than anybody who was just doing it for money would do. And mm -hmm. that's really how we, how we managed to, to do it. And the time is essential because you, you don't get to the bottom of these things. It's not fast. Um, if you do, you just film the predictable. But also, when we hadn't found our star, we'd be, we'd be filming other creatures. You know, we'd, we'd be looking for those smaller interactions. For this film? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so the journey of this film is, is the, as the Athena, the, the elephant, leads her herd to find a different uh, source of, uh, of water. Um, uh, can you refresh me if, like, what the span of time is that uh, the, the, the narrative of the film spans? I mean, it really spans probably a year, but it took us four years to, to collect all the material. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very focused time when we were with Athena and her family, um, but then there was so much to do around that. I mean, things like, things like getting the, those, the dramatic weather shots that we tried. You know, we couldn't do that. If we had a helicopter coming in just for a, a week or two for the production, we couldn't do that. So what we, we had, we had two light planes and they were rigged up, ready to go with, with the mounts and that. And so we could react to, to spectacular weather. If we got dramatic thunderstorms coming through or dust storms, then we'd, you know, we'd, we'd run down to the strip, get in the planes and just try and get up there to, to film it. Um, so, and it was all those things that just, it just took time. I mean, if you were filming with human beings, you would be in a kind of constant dialogue with them. You know, what do you think is going to happen tomorrow? So you can kind of prepare and, well, you, know, yeah. what, you know, what are you going to be doing next week? Um, but clearly with animals, uh, it's different. And, and I, in the year that you're filming as this takes place, can you just kind of talk us through, you know, when you're filming, when you're not filming, how you're making decisions about what's needed and what's not? I mean, when, when we... Well, with Athena, we'd just try, and her family, we'd try and spend 
as much of the day with them as possible. Um, so we'd go out early morning. We'd know where they'd been the pre- or we'd left them the previous night. And if we could find them by vehicle, so much the better. If we couldn't, then we'd fly. And then we'd direct the vehicles in again, if we, only if we could find them. And then we'd spend as much of the day as we could with them. And the thing about elephants is they're active in the morning. And then around sort of late morning when they heat up, they'll generally try and find a water hole. And then they'll probably sleep in the shade for the rest of the day and then start to get active again in the evening. Um, so we had very, very short windows of opportunity when, when things were happening and when the light was good. Yeah, we were always trying to film in sort of either end of the day just so that for the light. And uh, Victoria, can you describe you know, the bond that you had with the elephants and, uh, and vice versa? And what, you know, where, uh, w- you know, was there any line that you felt like you shouldn't cross when you're filming with them? I think we, our rule would be that you never interfere unless, and with this did happen on several occasions, you, for example, find an abandoned calf where either the the family's been already been shot or they've been, for some reason, separated. And we went through one phase where we kept finding calves on their own. And at that, when that happens, we would absolutely, we'd call in the um, Sheldrick Wildlife Trust and they would come in and, and rescue the babies. But otherwise, it, it's a, it would be a bit like um, sending in a social worker to, to sort out a problem in a way, who was complete, or oh, not, and you're sending somebody in to break up a family if you, mm-hmm. if you went in to try, we, we don't know enough to, to, to interfere. Mm-hmm. So we tend to very much leave, let what happens happen. The big question around uh, wildlife uh, films is the way that storytellers are naturally drawn to kind of anthropomorphize them uh, to, you know, to, make their stories more like human stories. And I wonder what your thinking is behind that. I think for, for 20 years, we, we wouldn't dream of, of assigning sort of feelings or emotions to animals. But I think, you know, the last 10 years, we've come so much further. And we just realize now that it's, we're only different by a matter of degrees. So in a way, with elephants, because you can read them so, so easily, you know, it's obvious that they, have, they share very similar emotions to our own. And in a way, not to, not to either name them, which is what scientists do anyway, or ascribe emotions, is to do them, a, I, I feel, a, a huge disservice. So we had no hesit- we discussed it, but we had, in the end, we had no hesitation in, I mean, we, we tried to tell, not to tell people what they were thinking, we tried to, be, to show people um, by, actually by, just by showing them and let them come to their own conclusions. But it was very obvious to us that they do share so many emotions with us. And I think also with this film, uh, one of our aims was to, to reach a, a global audience of people who don't even know they love elephants. Mm-hmm. Like we, we know from the past films we've done how to, um, to tap into people, all the passionate people who love wildlife and love, um, care about the environment. But really what we wanted to do was to say, um, to invite everybody else in to, to love elephants. And elephants, they're just the perfect animal um, to work with to do that. Um, Mark, can uh, you t- uh, talk about some of the uh, tricks you use in cinematography to, to capture all this d- different range of species yeah, from the largest <laughs> to the smallest? Well, I mean, we, we used, you know, as every, anything we could, really. Um, we. I mean, we were very keen to try and, um, because we, we had so many of the smaller creatures who essentially lived their lives at elephant toenail height, we were very keen to show the elephants from, from their perspective. So when we had to, when we could, we'd dig down beside a water hole, we'd dig down a, um, a metal box, perhaps a metre by a metre by just a little higher, right down into the riverbank with a, a slit at, at water level so we could basically wait for the elephants to come down and then try and film them from the, the same perspective of the small animals. But we used, we used our planes a lot, we used drones, we used macro benches, I mean, anything we needed to try and um, really try and get the intimacy with both the small animals and, and the elephants. What is the hardest animal to, to film? <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I think the bullfrog, funnily enough, the bullfrog, mm. um, just because we had to wait so long for them to come out, because bullfrogs... They seem to spend most of their life underground asleep in a, in a state of estivation. And it's only when you get 
really, really heavy rains, which might not happen every year. Um, when, when you do, if you get very heavy rain, several inches of rain and it soaks the ground, then they'll come up. Uh, but then they'll, they'll only mate for probably a few hours. They'll call and mate for a few hours, and they seem to disappear back into the bush. And we spend a lot of time driving around, probably covered thousands of kilometers in the course of four years. Wait, you know, we'd go to a water hole, we'd listen for bullfrogs, there's nothing there, we'd carry on. And we only, we only saw bullfrogs mating once for a few minutes in the whole, the whole four year period. <laughs> And, but, and you got it. We got it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it happened in daylight. I mean, yeah. often, most of the time, it happens at night. But this happened to be a pair that obviously having a good time, and they went on after sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Well, let's uh, bring the lights up and, uh, and make this uh, conversation interactive. If you have uh, questions, you can raise your hand, and uh, we'll bring you a microphone. See two on the aisle here. We'll get uh, you guys microphones. and. Um, Who's got a microphone? All I should right. just add that we have, we have two of the team here with us. We have Etienne O'Leaf, who is our assistant director. There you go. If you can just uh, stand up and ask your question, And we have please. Lucinda yeah. Engelhardt, who, who produced the film with Vicky. Oh, well, well, do, I, here, let's take this person. moment and, and just and point out the people yes. who... Okay. You should stand. Okay, do... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The film looks beautiful, congratulations. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little more about your, your filming strategy. Obviously, Athena was a focus. You had the two young elephants. So were you just filming the action, keeping them always in the frame? Did you have specific behaviors or things that you had in mind as you went along? And um, how big was the rest of the herd, by the way? I mean, the herd, the herd varied a bit. It was probably between eight and 11. Um, it, it depended often what would happen was that males would attach themselves to the herd for a few days. Um, but the core was basically um, Athena, um, two or three other females, and, and, the, and the youngsters. Um, and our, I mean, our strategy really was to, I mean, it, so much of it was driven by, by the seasons. Um, and we'd, we'd do a lot of scouting. Um, when the elephants were there and when we could follow them, then we'd be right on them all the time. Other times we'd be look, out looking for... Because, I mean, we had a fairly open slate and it was really what other smaller creatures that were somehow linked to the elephants that we could find and film and be, and be part of their lives. Um, so we, had a, we were always sort of casting for those, for those creatures. What, what we tend to do is you go out, you start the film with a sort of very broad arc of the story that you want to tell. And you don't really, we didn't know who the little guys would be. They, and we didn't obviously know who, which elephant we'd be working with. And then you, you go with what happens. And sometimes it takes you in a completely different direction. And part of the, the art of it is um, being able to follow that, predict what might happen next so that you get into the right place at the right time. And then all the time, constantly, we're talking about how we're going to weave the story together based on what we're gathering because we can't predetermine it other than this very basic storyline that we start with. So in, in the bush, we're a very tight team. There's probably a total of eight or 10 of us. Um, and we're always, you know, we, we, we eat together. We, we're like a sort of small family in a way, a bit like Athena's family. And you know, everybody relies on each other because you're, you're remote. But at every mealtime, you know, we'd, we'd sit down, and we'd talk story, we'd talk about what had happened that day. Vicky would be, would be editing as we went along. So we'd be, we'd be looking at rough edits of sequences and seeing how they'd, they'd all fit together. Yeah, I mean, we had an amazing process where literally the, it, the footage would come in from the field, it would go through all sorts, the, the logging, the ingesting, whatever, and within 24 hours, that, that's when we were really, ro we knew we were rolling, was when we could get a little edited piece in 24 hours in the bush with solar panels or generators um, miles from anywhere. It, uh, all right, there was another hand up there. We'll get uh, mic. Oh, you've got a microphone yes. already? Hi. We'll, we'll get you. Go ahead. Um, I, I, I'm hopefully going to see the film tomorrow. I can't wait. And uh, I have filmed in Kenya. And I just wondered uh, do you have your own production company there? Or are you? Um, uh, we, yeah, well, we have, we're based in the UK. And can you, so we tend to do the editing and the post production in the UK just because after you've spent four years so intensely on something like this, you, you actually need to, well, we find we need to just pull back a bit and get a completely dis different perspective on life and a different pace. So they, our production company is actually based in the UK, um, but our whole crew is obviously in Kenya. 
Uh, can you just comment a little bit on, or talk a little bit about the, um, the pathway that they followed? I think you said you were in the um, National uh, Reserve, was it? Yeah, we're, um, no, we, 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 it, we, we're in the sort of Savu Amboseli ecosystem, so, so, which is very fluid, and also fluid between being in the park and outside the park. Let's talk a little bit about how far uh, your elephants went and, and you know, yeah. some mm. of what they encountered. I mean, it, it was almost, almost 100 miles. Um, we never measured it exactly. Um, but they start, they'd start up in the north and then go down across the... Um, a very dry area, which we called the Badlands, used to be called the, the Taru Desert, um, to a waterhole right, right down in the south, I guess the southeast of the park. Um, so when we saw the elephants, they never actually, when we were watching Athena, she never went outside the park. But there would be times when we, we'd totally lose them. They traveled sort of 20 or 30 kilometers overnight. Um, and Savo is very thick bush um, with very few tracks through it. And often, you know, we'd be able to, we'd see them from the air, but we wouldn't be able to reach them on the ground. And sometimes, you know, a day or two later, we'd lose them completely. Yeah. I mean, we often lost them for, for periods. But the amazing thing is that a lot of the, the waterholes are linked by elephant tracks. And some of those are, you know, are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Um, and, you know, all the, other, all the other game uses them as well. Um, so they're well-defined and they're dug, you know, they're, they're trodden several inches deep into the, into the dirt. Well, isn't, isn't it right that even the, the route from Mombasa to Nairobi is believed to be an old elephant well, I, track? Well, I think, I think a lot of the current roads now do follow, do follow old elephant tracks. Yeah, because yeah. it would have been the way from the best lands yeah. to the best lands. Yeah, and you'd follow them. People would follow them, you know, go from one waterhole to the next the same way as the elephants would, or from one area of sort of a salt lick to a waterhole. So when you lose an elephant, do you have to <laughs> get up in a plane to find it? Or? We did. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. Yeah, we, both, well, we, all, we, we all fly, so we, we, we go up and we just look. But even, so, even, even flying, you'd be surprised at how, how you can lose elephants. Um, yeah. Yeah, or you think you've seen the right one and it's not the right one. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right uh, right there on the... Yes, uh, Victoria Mark. Uh, it looks amazing. Uh, great. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, how do you raise money for uh, a documentary that uh, that would have an unpredictable finish, uh, and uh, that would that would taking that would be taking so long? Uh, my second question is: I am a documentary director myself, uh, not experienced in shooting wildlife, but I'm producing my first feature film, and there is a scene with gophers. Uh, the little girl talking to gophers, maybe you could give me a practical to advice on how to... <laughs> <laughs> but, but by gophers, do you mean these are, are these are the little rodents? The, the, the undergrounds, those, the, the little ones that live underground. Okay, I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, filming them underground I think would be very tricky. Um, <laughs> to uh, film them on the ground, but yeah. above the ground, uh, and the little girl is talking to them. She's communicating with them. Puppet. Gosh. gosh. Um, Puppet. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't John Chester have a good idea? Yes. I mean, I don't know how John... Yeah. I mean, we just saw John Chester's film. Um, the, the wonderful film, The, um, the Biggest, the biggest, biggest little, farm. little Farm. And there are, there are gophers there, but they're all being eaten by coyotes and, and things. Mm. I mean, I think, you know, in, as a wildlife filmmaker, you'd want to... You either have to tame them down or put a hide up, um, or you try and find a place where they were used to, used to people. Um, and if you could find somewhere where they were habituated or maybe somebody fed them or something, um, then I guess you get your, your, your gopher and your subject in the same frame. And, um, but yeah, I mean, very, very tricky. Um, um, but I don't, know, I don't really know gophers. And as to, to how to, we yeah, raise To answer the money your on, earlier question, um, we... We so wanted to tell our own story and not be told what to do by a whole load of suits. And so we, we basically raised money from um, private investors and kept the budget to the lowest we possibly could. This was in the beginning. And I think once people began to see what we were doing, then confidence gained and people got very excited and then we were able to put the whole thing together and move forward but retaining creative control. So um, can you talk about some of those key steps? I mean the, the audience is filled with documentary yeah. filmmakers who would probably be fascinated to understand you know how much you filmed, what you showed, where you showed it, uh, you know what was the breakthrough? Yeah. Um, 
I, mean, I, I think to begin with, we didn't, we didn't have all the money for, the, for a film of this scope. So what we did was we knew we had enough money to go out there and make, and make um, a film of um, yeah, just perhaps in a, in a couple of years. And then what happened was we did that and we started getting results and we went, you know, we, we went back to our investors. They, they got excited about it. So you were able to cut mm. together mm. Uh, yeah. something, show evidence of the beauty of what you were getting and the emotion of what you were getting. Yeah, I think it was also... It, I think the most important thing that has made this film possible has been a mixture of the films we've done before and then people's sort of trust in us and building up those relationships very slowly over a very long time so that, um, so that people... You know, people came forward in a way we would never have expected and in a way that um, I don't think we could have done if we had done it fast, if we'd just gone around asking for money. I don't think it would have worked. I think it was this very organic growth um, and sort of, as you say, proof, the proof of the concept. We didn't, really go we didn't spend ages putting together little pieces. It was much more done through um, talking about it and we didn't spend money or time... Um, putting together endless sort of uh, um, written pieces or... Because on the whole, we found those never really worked. It was just people slowly seeing what we were doing. So st I think the, actually the key would be starting small, but start. Because then if you're onto something good that people get excited by, they want to be part of it. I mean, it did feel, when we started out, it felt as precarious as making our first film. And our first film, we had no idea how to use the camera. We'd, we'd literally saved up for a, you know, and spent all our inheritance on a 16 mil Bolex in, a, in an underwater housing and two lights and taught ourselves to use it. And this film, I remember at the time thinking, crikey, it's taking me back 30 years. It, I remember just how it fe felt, and it felt just as precarious. Mm -hmm. um, but then as we, as we progressed and we started to get results, so our ambition and our confidence grew. But also we could have continued to make... Um, we, would, we were doing... We've made nearly all our other films for National Geographic and for, other, for BBC, other sort of um, global broadcasters. But we found that there was becoming... We didn't want to make sort of tooth and claw films. We wanted to make a... We, we, we wanted to be true to our vision of the what from... And our, our story and our way of doing it. Um, and we've held on to that. I mean, you know, do, holding on to that for eight years, you obviously go through some periods where you think the world's fallen on your head. Um, you just holding on to that vision and keeping going and knowing that the core of what you're trying to do is, is worthwhile and you can see it and just keeping going at, towards it. Okay. Uh, you have a hand up here if we can get a microphone or if, is there... Here, let, let's get you a microphone, please. Yeah. Um, what's your plan to show it in Africa? Um, we, th we'll be discussing that with Apple, who we're absolutely delighted to be partnering with um, for the release of the film. Um, but what we have got, and what we've done right from the beginning, is to develop um, an outreach program. And th the idea for that was that we wanted to make the, the, the a film that would talk to the world and the, a, lo a feature film which made people fall in love with elephants. But then alongside, we wanted to produce um, different uh, thing, different materials and things which we could use in Kenya to um, excite children particularly because such a large um, uh, percentage of the population is under 15. A lot of people very removed from wildlife. So we're working actually with um, the government there to do things like we're doing a series of children's learn to read books where all the stories are based on characters from the film and with the idea that it doesn't matter where you live, if you live in the middle of Nairobi, you could still, you, you, if you've learned to read on these, through these books, those characters are your friends and you, you understand how the wild works a little bit. Um, so we have got, we're putting a massive effort into, uh, into that. But we'll also have the film, the film will be translated into Swahili and Ma, which are the sort of two principal languages where elephants, you know, in the, in the communities in which elephants are found. And we will have a big, a, a big programme of community screenings. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's so important that it's, 
that it goes back to, to where it was filmed. And that's, you know, that, that's driven the whole sort of outreach and education programme, which, yeah, which I mean, Etienne Et, has been Etienne heading. is heading that in um, East Africa at the moment, and we're heading it in the UK. So between us, we're, we, we're working as hard on that as we have been on the film. Okay, who's got a question? Uh, see a hand up here, we'll get your microphone. Hello. I just had to, uh, two quick questions. First, is it going to show on IMAX was one question I had. And then the other one is about your editing process. You talked about putting together little sequences, but I wondered over a four-year period how you managed to craft the story from your broad concept down into the actual story arc. I haven't seen the film yet, so I'm not yeah. sure. Okay. Um, so again, the, the giant screen um, question will no doubt be talking you know, <laughs> with, with Apple. Um, but uh, the editing process, so what I, what I tend to do in the field is to, um, it's all done in little, little pieces, little chunks, usually related around scenes. And then we have the most wonderful um, editor in the UK, Dave Dickey, um, who we've worked with many times. And that, at that point, when we're back in the UK, we're beginning to weave the, the, the bigger story. And um, I would say, work out how we should order the sequences in order to keep the right pace and um, yeah, and tell the story that we can see is beginning to emerge. Okay, who's got a main question? Here we got a hand up in the front here, if we can get, bring the microphone to the front. Hello, I'm Mary Angela. I'm, uh, I'm just a composer. I like to make music and sing and so on. I'm not a screenwriter, not a director, but I, I love movies. I love the, the, the procedure of making movies. That's why I'm also here. And I'm really amazed at what you did. It's really, really incredible, incredible work you did. I have a personal question. Uh, I know elephants are very, very um, emotional like us in a way, right? Mm -hmm. And they have, they're known for having an incredible memory. I was wondering, are you actually becoming friends? Are you friends with some elephants? Are they, do they miss you when you <laughs> go back? Uh, are, you, are they looking forward to seeing you? I mean, there must be something like that, because as far as I know, this must be a very, like, this has, must have become like a part of your life, and I imagine that's why you, you like to be there also, besides, yeah. of course, everything else has to do with I'm, your job. I mean, you're so right. I mean, I suspect they don't miss us as much as we miss them. <laughs> But, um, but there is that the, we did have one, what, one night in our tent, so we were in a canvas tent, and there was a noise like shuffling. And after a while, it went on and on, and I was about to say to Mark, as I thought he was trying to put his shoes on to go out to have a pee in the bush, and I was about to say, for goodness sake, just put your shoes on. You know, <laughs> and then he said, shh, Vic, there's, there's an elephant just by the tent. And this elephant, at the edge of the tent where the rainwater falls off, the grass grows the greenest. And this elephant had come to eat that strip of grass. And as he ate, the, his tusks were rubbing up against the, the window just very, very slowly. So we sort of just lay there and listened for a while. And then Mark, after we thought, OK, this, let's move him on, Mark just sort of said, OK, off you go. You know, and talked to him gently, and he moved off gently. Anyway, that was the beginning of the relationship with an elephant who kept coming back into camp and we couldn't quite understand why he was... So this is a big 25-year-old, it was 25 years old, um, bull that kept coming back into camp and was very, very relaxed. And then one day we suddenly began to think, this, this couldn't be an ex-orphan, could it? And this, this, it turned out, we then thought, OK, let, let's find out. So we, we got one of the keepers from the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust to to come, eventually we managed to get the elephant and the keeper there at the same time. Um, and they recognised it, um, this elephant as being one who they had released back into the wild 25, or so maybe 20 years previously. And so, I mean, you suppose you could say that was just an elephant being relaxed around people, but somehow there was more going on there. Yeah, I mean, we could tell he had a story, you know, because he would, he, would, he would hang out with, he would like to come into camp and was very comfortable with people. Um, and it was lovely when they met because both the, I mean, the keeper was in no doubt that this was an elephant he'd raised called, called a dume, but he, which he'd last seen when he was sort of eight years old. And the elephant 
and Dume had, no, you know, there was no doubt in our mind that he recognised the keeper. So I think memory is absolutely what, what elephants have um, hmm. to an extraordinary degree. Well, I, I think we're going to uh, have to close out on, uh, on that beautiful story. Except let me ask you, I mean, given that you were able to lose an elephant over the course of a day, uh, do you have the ability to keep track of where some of you, the elephants in your film are, are today? No, Only if um, we find them, you know, yeah. we'd have to look for them. We don't have any tagging or anything like right. that. I mean, quite often scientists will, will, will collar an elephant, but none of these elephants were, were collared. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you for your beautiful film. Do you, uh, do you know when it has a screen again at, uh, at TIFF? I think it's screening Tomorrow at 9.15. Tomorrow at 9.15. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I hope you all get a chance to see it. If not at the festival, then uh, next year when Apple releases it. Uh, we're going to do a qu quick change, change of uh, stage in just a couple minutes. I'll be back to introduce our next speaker. Thanks very much to Victoria Stone and Mark Diebel.